Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see you all here today, especially given the weather. I understand schools were closed today, so I know we probably lost a lot of parents in the audience. Um, but it's really great to see you, and we are recording this. So for those of you who may have colleagues or friends who are going to attend who didn't make it, we will have a recording for them to watch. Um, I'm Elizabeth Smith. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. I'm a professor of biological sciences. Um, and together with Christy Clemens, I am co-director of the Dialogue Project, our new skill building initiative aimed towards providing faculty, staff, and students with training in essential collaborative dialogue skills. Our work is inspired by two simple guiding principles, learn by observing and learn by doing. And I can't think of a more compelling inaugural speaker for the Dialogue Project than renowned psychologist and author Mark Brackett. He's devoted his career to understanding the role of emotional intelligence in learning, decision making, creativity, relationships, physical and mental health, and workplace performance. And importantly, he's used the knowledge he's gained from his research in developing evidence-based approaches to facilitate social and emotional learning. I came across Mark's work at a time when I was looking for tools for the faculty I was trying to understand why does dialogue break down and what could I do to provide the faculty with the tools to engage in dialogue both in the classroom with their students and with each other. I was looking back at my, uh, my email and I noticed it's been almost two years since I initially contacted Mark and I couldn't be more delighted that he's able to join us here at Dartmouth today and that he's been so incredibly generous with his time meeting with community members today and even tomorrow morning. Now we're all eager to hear from Mark, so I'll share some of his career highlights here very briefly. Mark is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, a professor at Yale's Child Study Center, and the author of the best-selling book, Permission to Feel, which has been translated into 25 languages. I just want to point out, we obviously have some copies here um, for our um, audience members, and uh, Mark has generously um, uh, agreed to um, sign books if you're interested. He's published over 175 scholarly articles, received numerous awards, and is featured regularly in popular media outlets. Mark is also the lead developer of RULER, an evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning that has been adopted by over 3,000 public, charter, and independent K-12 schools across the United States and around the world. He also regularly consults with large companies such as Google and Microsoft on best practices for integrating the principles of emotional intelligence into training and product design. Most recently, he and his team collaborated with Pinterest co-founder to develop an award-winning and free app called How We Feel, designed to teach emotion skills and enhance well-being. I could go on, but I'll stop here and simply say, please join me in welcoming Mark Brackett. Well, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Great. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for hosting me. And we had a great dinner last night, and I'm looking forward to dinner tonight. Um, and I really had a great opportunity to meet with so many people today, from the senior leadership team of the university to chairs of departments to other faculty, and tomorrow with some students. Uh, and I thought that, you know, when Elizabeth and I were talking about this presentation, kind of this intersection of emotions, emotional intelligence, and like, how do we communicate in the world around us? And why do these skills matter? So that's where we're going to go. Um, I don't, I'm not very good at planning my presentations. And so I kind of have to feel it, and, uh, <laughs> no pun intended. And, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that all of you will kind of like be with me on this journey. I just thought I would start off by sharing a few things that, that I've seen in my research in terms of what's current in, in, in regard to workplace concerns. And there's four or five kind of areas that seem to be the challenges right now. People are concerned about mental health, which makes a lot of sense. People are concerned for good reason about equity, particularly around race and gender and kind of wealth discrepancies. People are concerned a lot about loneliness and connection burnout and having some kind of balance in their lives. 
you know, around you know, well-being. So we're going to keep that in the back of our minds. But first, we're going to learn a little bit about our feelings. This is a tool that uh, has been around for a couple of decades now that we built based on a research model of emotion. And essentially, what I'm going to try to do is teach you this in like 30 seconds. All right, all of you, how many of you woke up this morning? OK, good, you're here. And uh, my hunch is that you woke up. And anybody wake up sometimes, and you look around, you're like, gosh, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> or, you know, like, or how am I feeling? Or you don't even, we don't really tend to ask ourselves, how are we feeling? But we tend to think about, like, do I want to approach this day? Or do I want to kind of like stay in bed and pull the covers over my head? And so the mood meter helps us be more specific than that. On the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. So pleasantness is literally what's going on in your brain right now. Your brain is sending signals. It's thinking. And it's saying, I want to be here. I don't want to be here. I want to approach this content. I'm eager to learn. Or you know what? This doesn't really resonate with me or sit with me very well. I feel safe and comfortable. I don't feel very safe and comfortable. So on the x-axis right now, I'm going to ask you to go here. And just minus 5, you're thinking, this is going to be the worst experience of my life. <laughs> like, I already can't stand this guy from Yale. Minus 3 is like everyday misery. <laughs> 0 is kind of neutral. Plus 3 is like, all right, this is going to be pretty good. Plus 5, you're looking at me like, oh my god. <laughs> this is amazing. So where are you right now? Everyone has a number? Good. Now, emotions are more, they're, just, they're more than just thoughts. They're bodily sensations. And so we're going to think about now how we're feeling from a body perspective, about your energy, your level of activation. So some of us might feel very energized right now, and some of us might feel quite depleted of our resources right now. Minus 5 would mean that you're just extremely tired and feel kind of deactivated. Plus 5 is you've kind of got lots of energy. So where would you place your body right now in emotion space? Good? Obviously, we cross our two axes, and we create our medidor emocional. So we've got yellow, red, blue, and green. Let me get a raise of hands. How many of you are somewhere in the yellow? You're high energy and pleasant. <coughs> Wow, that's a lot of people. Interesting. I know, a rainy Friday afternoon, everybody's happy. That's weird. Um, how many of you are in the green? You're pleasant, but your energy is kind of low. Anybody in the blue or red? No one. Oh, we got one, thank you. One honest person in the room. Um, Let's be real, right? We're a room filled with academics and students and people who work at a university. And only one person is admittedly right, feeling a little red and blue. Kind of doesn't feel that accurate to me. But <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> what I'd like you to do now is convert your color to a specific feeling word. OK? You got three seconds to find the feeling word or words Freeze. All right, now I need an honest raise of hands. How many of you had a little trouble finding the word? Hands up high. Like really high. Stretch it out. Really, really high. Like really, really high. Like stick it out there. Freeze. No, no, leave it up. Look around the room. So we're at Dartmouth, right? And people are struggling to describe their feeling. Any hypotheses around that? Why would it be that people who are so smart are emotionally illiterate? <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts? Yes? We have a very limited vocabulary on our emotions. Yeah, that's, a, that's pretty good. We're, we, it's like happy, fun. How are you feeling? Fine. Any other hypotheses? By the way, I do a lot of audience participation. <laughs> Other hypotheses? Okay. Why? Yes? I think um, growing up, we are more incentivized to talk about like, academic or quantitative things rather than feeling. So it's harder for us, at least for me, to express um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not something you maybe even asked a lot to do. Any other hypotheses? Yeah. It's more vulnerable. You're, yeah, right. It's more vulnerable. Especially if you ask me how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? Great. <laughs> <laughs> ask me how, I'm how are you feeling? Hanging in there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> ask me how I'm feeling again. How are you feeling? Well, to be honest with you, <laughs> I'm a little bloated from my lunch. I have a little acid from the coffee up here. I'm tired, I'm excited, I'm overwhelmed, I'm eager, and I'm having this like weird existential kind of like mixture of anxiety and overwhelm. Wow, that's a lot going on. <laughs> it is. And she's like, good luck. <laughs> right? And so like the question is like, what do you do with all these feelings? And that's a big part of our work, because we don't just want to identify them. That's a good piece of the work, being aware, and as I like to say, granular about our feelings. But we've got to know what to do with our feelings. So that's another question I have for all of you. We're here for about an hour to talk about this work. Raise your hand if at some point during my talk you will get distracted. OK, everybody. It's great. I just see the, I see the headlines in the newspaper article, Dartmouth, emotionally illiterate and attention deficit disorder. <laughs> um, so, all right, well, I know, you know, it's not like, I, I came here three hour drive, you know, like to, to give a speech. I don't want everybody to be distracted during my talk. So what might be your strategy to deal with your feelings? during my presentation so that you can be, as they like to say these days, present. Repression. <laughs> You're going to repress your feelings? Be oh, all right. Write that one down. <laughs> You're going to repress your feelings. <clears throat> How do, what does that mean for you? I would try to ignore the feelings that distract me. OK. All right, thank you. Other strategies. We're not going to leave it at repression. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like that one I'm writing down. No, just kidding. Yeah. Medication. <laughs> You're going to just take pills during my talk? Yeah. OK. I mean, I, am, I think I'm moving here. <laughs> I never felt so needy in my whole career. <laughs> All right. Any other strategies? Please. Get rid of distractions that I can get rid of. Put my phone on silent and in my bag. OK, so just like eliminate kind of things that will distract you. Thank you. Other strategies? Yeah, please. Yeah, just uh, try to engage to maintain curiosity. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, so try to engage to kind of re. Yeah. yeah. Stay with it. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Was there one more person? All right. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that we haven't had a lot of education <laughs> in emotion regulation, unless people are just feeling like uncomfortable sharing. Like really, like first of all, like if you're a parent, raise your hand if you're a parent. All right. How many of you want your kids to be engaged in school? Right, but they're there right from 7.30 or 8 in the morning till 3 or 4 in the afternoon. And you're expecting you drop them off, and they're going to be engaged, good learners for the entire day, focused. I'm just trying to get you to here for an hour. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know. I'm going to be distracted. I don't know what to do. I'm going to repress my feelings. Or... <laughs> um, and so if it's interesting to me, like how we think about this, about how do we experience feelings? And then what do we do with those feelings? All right. Let's take a nice, long inhale. Just kind of get settled in your seats. So of course, there's a cheat sheet. Um, and you get, a free, you get a free cheat. You don't even have to cheat. You get a free book. Um, this is the inside cover of my book to give you some words to describe your feelings. And as you can see here, there are many words that we can use to describe our feelings instead of, OK, fine, or stressed. 
Maybe you're down, disappointed, devastated, hopeless, full of despair. Maybe you're happy, excited, late, ecstatic. Maybe you're calm, content, tranquil, peaceful, relaxed. One of the goals of our work, the conversation today, will be about getting more specific. I do want to give you all a free treat. As um, Dean Smith mentioned in my introduction, uh, one of the benefits of the pandemic, which is weird to talk about it that way, was that the founder and co um, the co-founder and CEO of Pinterest read my book and he reached out to me and he said, would you like to partner and take your book and make it into an app and make it available for free across the world? And I'm like, yeah, sounds great. And so we have partnered for the last couple of years, uh, my team and his team, and we built this app that now um, has come out and we have about a million users and it's free. It's on iOS and Android. And essentially it's gonna be my talk in an app where you're going to be able to kind of check in with how you're feeling choose one of 250 words to describe how you're feeling with this definition, tag your feelings with th things like, where am I, who am I with, what am I doing, so that you can get more specific about understanding why you're having your feelings. You could journal about your feelings if you like, and then you can choose strategies to help you regulate your feelings, whether you wanna do a mindfulness exercise or a cognitive strategy or reach out to someone for social support. And then importantly, you can track those feelings over time and analyze them so that you can get little graphs to see what your emotional life is like. So check it out. I think it's fun and useful. Now, I've been curious since we're in a workplace school setting, like how are people feeling these days you know, at work? And anyone want to guess what the number one emotion is that people are having at work? Overwhelmed. You sounded overwhelmed when you said it. <laughs> It's frustration, actually. The number one word that people use was frustration. Now, this is different, because a couple years ago when I did research, it was stressed. It was overwhelmed, actually, last year. But for whatever reason, the word that people are using these days is frustration. I also asked all of you, or those of you who took the survey that um, Dean Smith sent out, um, what emotions are you struggling with? And um, here are the results of your data. And overwhelm is in there, uh, but frustration still sits there. So some people said none, but when you, if you look at the aggregate data, um, you can see here that a large percentage of it uh, is frustration, anxiety, overwhelm. Another question we ask people is, how do you want to feel? Nobody says, I want to feel frustrated, overwhelmed, and anxious. <laughs> so what all of you said, was joyful, satisfied, excited, fulfilled, happy. Uh, these are all the most, these are hot off the press from you. And so this brings up a question for me, which is, you know, what are we supposed to do with all of our feelings? When you think about people are living a lot, at least in the real world, none of you, only one person in here, but the people who don't go to Dartmouth or work here, the real world, right, tends to be quite red and blue these days. Then they tell us, well, I don't want to be there. I want to be in that yellow green place. I know it's hard to be in yellow and green all the time, don't you think? I know I, don't, I struggle trying to be happy all the time. Um, I don't even like people who are happy all the time. <laughs> like, it drives me out of my mind. And so, it leads me as a researcher to think about, well, what is the goal? Like, what are we supposed to do with our emotional life? And the first thing I want to just say is that I think we have to understand why we have an emotion system. That emotions are signals, and they provide information. They're data for us. And oftentimes, I get a lot of resistance in my work because people think it's like fluff. You know, this is like the soft stuff. Even they call emotional intelligence a soft skill, which I don't even know where that came from. I think it's the most ridiculous term. Anyone here, I mean, just for curiosity, has anyone here, at least, let's say during the pandemic, did anyone here have a day where you were kind of like, I'm done? <laughs> Anybody have one of those days? Like, just, I am like done. I cannot deal with my feelings any longer. And how many of you thought, like, oh, that's, it's easy to deal with. I don't know, I find dealing with my emotions kind of the, one of the hardest skills to develop. 
Now, emotions matter. I've determined there are five reasons why everybody should be here. And none of them are to hear my opinions about anything. It's all about the research. The first is attention and memory. So let's think about it. We're in an education setting. How does this sound to you? People learn what they care about. What do you think? True, false? Yeah. Um, emotions drive how we perceive the world. What do you think about that? Makes sense, right? Um, anyone here ever bored in a classroom? <laughs> right, boredom is a, is a tricky emotion. People think of it as a bad emotion. I see it as a signal. It's information. It's saying, what's being presented right now is not working for me. <laughs> It's not engaging me, and so my brain has decided I'm going to go someplace else. Now, believe it or not, there is some good research which shows that boredom actually leads to creativity. It's not like it leads to, dis it leads to disengagement, meaning the person who is teaching you is not getting their point across and you're not learning from them. Not a good thing in a school. But nevertheless, it's not a bad emotion. It's a signal. It's information. I use the word attention and memory because, you know, for me, um, most people look at me as a, I'm a professor at a place like Yale, um, and they think, you know, Mark must have always been a good student. And he had to be. And the answer is wrong. Wrong answer, a wrong question. I was a failing student. Um, and I was, fail I was a failing student for a lot of reasons, one of which was I hated school, and I was terribly bullied in school, and I was unable to focus. What's interesting to me as I reflect on my life and my childhood as a kid who was victimized a lot in school is no one noticed it. Or people noticed it, but didn't feel like they needed to act on it. And there I was, you know, in fifth grade, learning, or sixth grade, the Roman oligarchy. It's like, honestly, you want me to like focus on the Roman oligarchy right now? <laughs> like, I hate this place. I want to, I need safety. I'm not interested in anything you have to tell me until you make me feel safe here. And we fail to recognize that how kids feel at every level, how we adults feel, is driving the way we process information, the way we retain information. The second is decision making. Has anyone here ever made a bad decision? <laughs> Would anybody like to just share publicly? <laughs> uh, I think we've all made bad choices, right? Um, I do research on emotions and judgment and decision making. And here's what I found. Emotions influence the choices that we make, but it happens outside of our conscious awareness. I'm going to say that again. Emotions influence the choices we make, but that happens outside of conscious awareness. Basic example, randomly assign educators to be in a good mood or a bad mood. It's pretty easy. I say I'm going to ask you to, for five minutes to write about a really crappy day, like a day that just was not good. And I'm, or I'm going to ask you in the other group to write about a day that just like you were flying high, like everything went great. And now I'm going to give you essays to evaluate. And I was curious in the research, would there be differences in the grades that the educators assign to the different essays? What we found was one to two full grades difference. When we asked the educators at the end of the study, do you believe that how you felt had any influence over the way you graded the paper? 90% said no. So again, what does that tell us? That our emotion system sometimes can bias the way we see the world. Anyone know the antidote to that? What's the antidote to our emotions shifting the way we evaluate things? Yeah, that's it. Self-awareness. So if, you know, I don't know, has anybody, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm like, an, I'm irritable in the morning. For whatever reason, I, I don't wake up like, I can't wait to start the day. <laughs> I wake up having kind of an existential crisis, like, what am I doing with my life? And why am I, am I is this anybody going to read my work? And like, I don't know. And we do this presentation, but everybody's going to be distracted. <laughs> <laughs> like, why am I talking to people who aren't listening? Like, it's like, that's a great career. 
Um, and sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get into it. I have, uh, you know, I like to be alone in the morning, and I don't always have that option. And so I'll be like irritable, and then I'll be like, I can't take it anymore. And I'll be have, maybe I had an argument at home, and then I'll get to my office, and then all of a sudden, you know, my assistant or a team member or one of my researchers will say like, I need you. I really need your feedback on this. And the question is, you know, is my feedback the best possible feedback? And what I've realized is that sometimes I'll be like, I actually think the paper is terrible. But it's not that the paper is terrible. It's that I'm not really in the mood to read it. Or I'm coming at it through the lens of the anger that I have about what happened at home. But before I go into my room or my office or even my building, when I get out of my car, if I take a deep breath and I'm like, Mark, how you think? You are annoyed. Why are you annoyed? Because you know, it's like the third time you've had this conversation at home and no one's listening to you. Oh, but you're annoyed about that. And so when you can attribute your emotion to its actual cause, it will have a lesser influence on the future. How simple is that? Just get in the habit of doing check-ins periodically throughout the day, and you'll be less biased and make fewer errors. The third is relationship quality. Oh, this is a big one. Raise your hand if you ever live with someone or work with someone who is very difficult to be around. <laughs> yeah. We've all been there. Um, I have a relative like that. I'm being recorded right now, though. I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> anyway, I used to live in New Hampshire, actually. And I had a relative of mine come visit me. I used to live in this, on the east coast of, of New Hampshire um, in a little town called, what the heck was it called? <laughs> um, York. York, Maine. Oh, that's Maine, not New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I worked in New Hampshire, but I lived in Maine. Anyway, it's all the same thing. Um, and uh, anyway. Uh, so I have this relative come visit me. I live in this cute little town. And honestly, it was like the, nice, the nicest people in the world. I used to go to this bakery in the morning, and the people who worked there would be like, would you like a refill? I'm like, yes. You know, thank you. You know, and it was just friendly, and they had the best scones, and the best, it was great. And so this relative comes to visit me. And I said, you know, I don't think I could, I don't know if I'm ready to go back to the kind of real world. And I think I, it just there's a different energy here. It seems just easier and nicer. And this person looked at me and said, you know, it's nice here, but I don't know. There's an underlying anger. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, there is. And I'm looking at it. <laughs> you know, like, you are doing a lot of projection here. And I, I want to emphasize that that we need to be really careful about that. Meaning that how we feel on the inside and how other people make us feel through the way they treat us, through the way they, their facial expressions, their body language, their vocal tone, activates us in ways that makes us want to be with or not. At the core, I'm convinced that our emotion system is a, is a signal system. It's saying, I want to approach because I feel safe and comfortable and I want to be with. Or it's messaging, I can't trust this person. They're disrespectful. They want more power. They, they want to have power over me. The fourth is mental health. I don't think I need to talk much about that. We know that if you don't have strategies to deal with your emotions, your physical and mental health will decline. The final one I think is relevant because I'm here at a university setting is performance. And I'll just say very quickly, you know, I really had a misunderstanding of emotions and performance when I was younger in my career. I was convinced as a person who grew up in a kind of a, I would say, a lower socioeconomic background. Um, my father was an air conditioning repairman. My mom had different jobs. And then I ended up at a university that just didn't, I was a public school student all the way through. And then I was, you know, I remember um, I was at this first meeting when I got to Yale, and this one other, like, young faculty member was like, you know, I've looked at your CV, you know. Can you remind me how many top tier first authored publications you have? 
I'm thinking to myself, like, this is what we're going to talk about at a party? Like, honestly, like, you're weird. Um, I, I mean, it was really weird to me, you know? And it was just like, I just, it didn't really go well for me. And I didn't, really didn't feel like I would belong. I felt like, I don't, I have no interest in having these kinds of conversations. Um, and I just felt, I, saw, I, I, I was seeing these things happen over and over again. And then I was getting very insecure because of just my upbringing. And I was just thinking, everybody else is going to, they're richer than I am. They have more opportunities than I have. They had parents who read to them. I didn't, my parents were like, why are you asking so many questions? <laughs> Literally, that was like, go to your room. You're asking too many questions. <laughs> and I had this thing about my students and the other people I worked with. Like, everybody was successful and I wasn't. And I had a definition of success that was based on SAT scores and grade point averages and musical instruments that people played that I never heard of, <laughs> you know, and volunteering in places that I never knew existed on the earth. Um, and now I've been like 25 years in this organization and watching and tracking students and kind of wondering, like, who is actually successful? And what I've learned is that kind of, I always joke about this, that oftentimes our cognitive abilities get us into these institutions but it's our emotional abilities that get us out. Because at the end of the day, what we find, and what's reality, is that you know, most people, like we know there's a restriction um, of cognitive abilities. Because it's like, I always make the analogy to basketball. Everybody who plays basketball is tall. So height no longer has prediction. Uh, height can no longer predict the success of a basketball player. Because everybody's, there's, there's no variability on that attribute. Well, there's not a lot of variability in our Ivy League institutions around cognitive abilities because everybody's capable. So it's got to be something else. It's got to be other variables that are contributing to who gets the job, who gets the, you know, who has the best relationships. And my research over and over is showing that it is the emotion skills. It's the people who can handle the disappointment well. It's the people who can deal with feedback and not get triggered and activated. It's the people who, uh, you know, on their path to being highly creative, recognize that there's a lot of failure and disappointment. And that doesn't mean I'm a failure. That just means I need to work harder and I need strategies to manage my emotions around that. So that's my, uh, I, I call this, and I joke in my, when I do talks for businesses, my money slide. Uh, <laughs> because. There's a lot of resistance. I get a lot of business people like, ah, oh, this emotion stuff, like whatever. And I say, you got to read the research. You got to know how emotions and how our emotion skills are directly linked to all these important attributes. Now, the big question is, how much have we learned about emotions in our lives? Well, here's what the data show. <laughs> Not very much. These are national data. Thousands and thousands of people. Think about that. Not very much at all. What about learning it at school? Even worse. <laughs> so basically, we have a society of people who have not really gotten an emotion education. And that leads me to the big piece here, which is, you know, did you have a feelings mentor? Did you, was there anyone who taught you about feelings? Yeah, question? It's a scale, just a Likert scale. You know, how much did you talk about, learn about emotions growing up in your household? How much did you learn about, talk about emotions, you know, in your school? But will there be a bias where people, like, say the parents believe they've taught the kids about emotion, but the kids didn't perceive it? Yeah, that's possible, for sure. There's more, well, we can get into some more of that in a minute, but good question. The, um, I have this, so, just to give you a little bit of my background, because you haven't read, obviously, much. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, not, uh, that was not, I didn't mean it that way. I meant about me. I'm talking about giving you a little background on me. Um, so I am today, I'm a 54-year-old man. I'm married. Um, I've been with my husband for 30 years. Um, and I um, grew up in northern New Jersey, a little town called Clifton. Don't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> 
Um, I didn't have a great education. I didn't like school. Um, I had um, some challenges. I have two brothers, both of whom are very close. I'm very close to. Um, but when I was in middle, when I was six years old, my middle brother was psychiatrically hospitalized. Um, never came home. He's now a doctor in Philadelphia. He was misdiagnosed completely. And I have an older brother, another brother who's my oldest brother, who um, is also, he's a biochemist um, and uh, was the vice president of a big pharmaceutical company. But he um, unfortunately had physical illness. He had Crohn's disease. And he was hospitalized at the same time. So at six years old, my, my family kind of got shaken up or shooken up. One brother goes into a psych psychiatric hospital. The other one goes into the traditional hospital to get surgery for his Crohn's. Um, and unfortunately for me, I was left with babysitters. And just to be honest with all of you, unfortunately, I was abused by the person who was my babysitter for about five years of my childhood. He was um, one of my parents' closest friends, and he lived next door. He actually was the head of the boys' club, which is quite sad. Um, and I was a victim of his abuse. Didn't share that with my parents. And I think part of it came from the fact that, you know, my mom was very anxious and was kind of just freaking out about what was happening in our home and saying things like, I'm having a breakdown, I'm having a breakdown. That's what I kind of heard as a kid. And I realized pretty quickly, like, I can't really talk to my mom about what's going on because she'll have a breakdown and it'll get worse. And my father was a great guy, and so was my mom, by the way. Just didn't know how to deal with your feelings. My father was, you know, a tough guy from New York. And he has this like kind of thing like, son, you gotta toughen up. Love me, but he was like, you gotta be a tough guy. I never forget, even when I was in high school, he's like, son, I shouldn't tell you this, but I used to beat kids up like you. I'm like, Dad, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not sure that's what they teach in parenting classes. <laughs> Anyhow. I ended up having a very good relationship with my parents, but it was tough as a kid. And anyhow, I share this with you mostly because of something else. My mother had a brother whose name was Uncle Marvin. Uncle Marvin was a middle school teacher in the Catskill Mountains of New York by day and a band leader at night who played the trumpet. And he was like the Robin Williams character in Dead Poet Society. And he happened to be living with us one summer. And by some wave of a crazy magic wand, he happened to be writing a curriculum to teach kids about feelings in his sixth grade social studies class. And so he's sitting with me in the backyard of my town. I'm in, we're just sitting in the backyard. And he looks at me like no adult had ever looked at me before. And he said, how are you feeling? But really. How are you feeling, Mark? And that was the moment that I decided to tell him what was happening. And it wasn't like toughen up or I'm going to have a breakdown. It was, we're going to get through this together. And he facilitated the disclosing of that to my parents. He facilitated the whole process of dealing with it. Now, I share that with you. Because I've become really curious. When, when I wrote my book, I dedicated it to my uncle, of course. And it's called Permission to Feel, because I feel like he was that person who created the conditions for me to be my true self. And I've been really curious in today's world, how many people have an Uncle Marvin? Or an Aunt Maria? Or anyone, a parent, a teacher, a coach, someone who helps them be their true, full feeling selves as they develop. And so let's look at the data. These are your data today. Just 40% of you said yes. 60% said no. So think about that. It's like, not that high. My national data, it's around 35, um, 65. So slightly higher, but not much. So let's think about that for a minute. Only 40% of us said that we had someone when we were younger who created the conditions for us to really talk about you know, and be our true, full feeling selves. Now, other questions I have, which are, all right, so if you had this person, how would you describe them? 
Like, who are these people? What are their characteristics? Anyone want to guess what the number one characteristic is of our feelings mentor? Listener. Listener. Non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. What's another one? All right, you're all cheaters. 100%, you got it. The number one characteristic is non-judgmental. Let's think about that for a minute. The person is non-judgmental. Compassionate, good listener, kind, empathic. I want you to notice that like probably 1% of people say the word, use the word wise. There's nothing cognitive about these feelings mentors. It's not that they're brilliant people, whatever that even means. It's all about this emotion system. It's all about creating the conditions of non-judgment, good listening, compassion, and empathy. We'll get more into this in a minute. Now, oh, I didn't show you your data, though, because I analyzed your data, too. So some, I got about 60 or 75 people completed the survey I sent out. Here's what all you said. Let's see if you're like the real world. Pretty much the same thing. Non-judgmental, empathetic, or empathic, good listener. Now, I've been really curious, too, about who are these people? So who, who else in our lives? The people are moms, grandmothers, fathers. But when I analyze the data, it gets down to, I mean, I just want you to think about this for a minute. Only 10% of us say that someone who raised us was the person who was our feelings mentor. That means 90% of us don't have a parent or caregiver who we see as that person. I've been really curious about that. And so I do a lot of work with families and parents. And you know, our program is now in 5,000 schools, not 3,000. I'm going to update my bio. And um, so 5,000 schools, that's millions of children that we serve. We're trying to create the feelings mentors for this next generation. But I meet, I meet these parents, and I show them these data, and they're like, we don't like those findings. <laughs> I'm like, I don't like them either. You know, it's like, but like data are not to like or dislike, they're just data. And so like, let's, ex let's try to get at it. Like, what's going on here? And so recently I was in Chicago and I was talking with families. And um, firstly, it was really interesting to me, this one mother, she's like, I'm having an epiphany. I'm like, okay, what's your epiphany? She's like, I realize right now that my daughter has a feelings mentor. My son definitely does it. And I'm leaving here today, and I'm going to find my son a family mentor. <laughs> and I was like, lady, it could be you. <laughs> I mean, it just, like, the, we're outsourcing everything right now. I'm going to, there's your karate teacher, there's your feelings mentor. <laughs> I mean, it just shows you how out of touch we are with our emotions and our emotional lives. And then I went on and talked to other parents. And you know, what's interesting to me is that you know, one mom said, I don't want to ask my kid how they're feeling. And yeah, that's, for me, that's like, tell me more. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I can handle what I would hear. Um, I'm not sure I'll know what to say or do if I learned how my child was feeling. So I'm just I'm reminding us, like, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of getting more comfort around our feelings life. Now, I'm very interested in adults, too. Oh, before I get there, I thought you would also want to know, like, does this predict anything? And um, the first thing it predicts is your ability to regulate emotions. So as adults, what we find in our research, people who said yes or no, just a simple yes, no, and then we do a little simple analysis in terms of your adult skill at regulating emotions. And what we find is that the people who are yeses 
who have said yes to the question have significantly higher scores on our measures of adaptive healthy regulation. What we also find is that these people are satisfied more with their lives, have greater purpose in life, sleep better, and have better physical and mental health. I mean, just think about that right now. This is one little variable. Did you have a feelings mentor? Yes or no? And people who said yes, believe it or not, in terms of the purpose and meaning in life, 20 to 25% higher in every study as adults. Now, one question is, what about work? Do we have someone at work with whom we can talk about our emotions? Interestingly enough, it's a little bit higher. 45% of people say yes. 55% uh, of people say no. What's interesting about that, I've done some follow-up research on that, and people say things what's well, easier at work, right? Because then you go home, you have to deal with it. Like, I can talk with someone, but then I don't have to live with them. <laughs> now, my question is, are these people different or the same in terms of their characteristics? What do you think? What are the top three characteristics of the people at work who are feelings, mentors, and coaches, and colleagues? <laughs> Guess what, everybody? Same. So I think this is getting at a pattern here in terms of, I'll call it the people we want to be around. We're craving to be around people. We feel safest. We feel the most comfortable around people who are non-judgmental, empathic, and good listeners. Now, how many of you feel like when you were going to school, there was this like cool curriculum that was called how to be non-judgmental? <laughs> I mean, when you really think about it, we've been judged from the moment we've been born whether it's about our height, our weight, our physical appearance, the color of our skin, our femininity, our masculinity. There's, it's just endless amounts of judgment. And where are we helping people think about being non-judgmental? Really, I'm, I'm struck by this, like the, this, this concept. You know, we learn about it like in Buddhism, you know, non-judgmental when you're meditating. Don't judge, the, you know, let the vexations come and go. But this is not that. This is about interpersonal judgment. What do you think? Why these three? Why are these coming up? Why are we saying that the people who are helping us manage and deal with our emotional lives are non-judgmental, good listeners, empathic? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's part of it. We just want to be heard and seen and acknowledged. Yeah. <laughs> it's a vulnerability. You just feel like safer around people who don't judge you, who will listen to you. Trust. Any other thoughts? Yeah. You're not necessarily looking for fix. Yeah. Notice that none, none, it's never... There's nothing there about fixing. It's all about being with. You might ask yourself, you know, um, this stuff, I mean, I obviously I care a lot about this work. And it, it, I always get reflective when I talk about it. Um, I was giving a speech about two years ago in Westchester, New York. And it was one of those moments where I was like, I was in my zone. And I was talking, I don't, before I wrote my book, I never spoke about my Uncle Marvin. You know, I talked about him as my colleague, but not the details of my story. I didn't feel safe to share my own story until I wrote my book at 49. And then all of a sudden, I'm giving this speech about this relationship I had with my uncle. And this guy is looking at me, he's like, are you talking about Marvin Moore, the sixth grade social studies teacher from Monticello, New York? I said, yes. He's like, your Uncle Marvin was my Uncle Marvin. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, your Uncle Marvin was my teacher, and he changed my life. I'm like, I've never met any of my uncle's actual students. 
This was 45 years later, he remembered. And he, I said, well, I have to give my speech, but can you stay after? And I'd like to interview you. Can I just record on my phone? Just I'm really curious. And he's like, I remember your uncle's facial expressions, his body language. I remember the, his tone of voice. I remember how he taught us these things and blah, blah, blah. It went on and on and on. But here's what was the kicker for me. He looks at me and he goes, it's pretty darn clear your uncle had a huge influence in your life. And I said, definitely. I am where I am psychologically and, and career-wise because of him. And he goes, well, I'm just curious, Mark. For whom are you and Uncle Marvin? And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not my strength area. <laughs> You know, I'm a scientist. You know, I like to do the research on the Uncle Marvins. And I have to tell you, it's, it was a wake-up call for me in terms of, like, paying it forward. And so, like, I really have made a concerted effort in my life to, like, how do I show up for my husband, for my nieces and nephews, for, for whoever, you know, with that non-judgmental, good-listening compassionate lens. You can ask yourself that question, too. Here's what you need to know. People who have those feelings mentors at work are happier in their jobs. They're less likely to want to leave their jobs. So essentially, you know, to get more granular and specific, I've come up with this idea that we should create a world filled with people who are emotion scientists as opposed to emotion judges. Wouldn't it be nice if we were around people who were open, curious, and reflective, viewed all emotions as information? We're always kind of in that learning mode, not the knower mode. Wants to get granular and specific, have a growth mindset. So that when you're dealing with your feelings, it's like, you know what, today was a rough day, but tomorrow might be better. I work with and know a lot of the emotion judges. I, I think I told this story at the senior leadership meeting this afternoon. But I give a, I give a speech at my university to a particular department. And um, at the end of the speech, this one veteran professor stood up. He opens up his jacket. And he gives me the posturing thing. And he's like, what happened to Yale? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I like, but the good thing for me is that I've had a lot of therapy. <laughs> And I have coaching, and I've got regulation strategies. I know how to deal with difficult people. I'm like, Mark, breathe in and breathe out. <laughs> this moment is impermanent. Um, and I just said, you know, tell me more. Uh, and he's like, you know, he went on and on. You know, this is Yale. Yeah, we produce Nobel laureates, not nice people. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing about this, is that I happen to have gotten a lot of background information about this department before I went to do the speech. And I happen to know that the people who work in that department hate their jobs. Nobody wants to be there. Remember, emotions are signals to approach or avoid. How many of you want to be raised by someone who has that energy? How many of you want to work for someone who talks that way and thinks that way about feelings? It just doesn't work. It's not accessible. There's, there's nowhere to go with the emotion judge. Right? Think about that. My father, you know, who was a good guy again, but he was like, he had a lot of anger problems. He'd say things like, son, this is the way I deal with things. You're going to have to learn how to live with it. There's nowhere to go with that. There's no learning there. There's no growth there. That's permanent, static. Not helpful. OK. So now we are going to give everyone permission to feel, including the people who don't even like that much. We're going to strive to be emotion scientists and not emotion judges. And that means we need some skills. We need to develop the skills to be that emotion scientist. So remember, there's the kind of compassion and non-judgment. And then there's the hard skills of emotional intelligence. So what are they? Well, the first skill is recognizing emotions, accurately perceiving our own and other people's emotions. That means self-awareness, like what's going on, like the mood meter I share with you. What's happening here for me? What's happening here for me? 
where am I in emotion space? It's when I'm looking at it, all of you, it's saying, how are you feeling right now? Do I know how you're feeling? Or am I guessing how you're feeling? I'm going to try it with all of you right now. Why not? I'm going to do a facial expression. I'm going to have the four of you. Sorry to put you on the spot. I may call on other people, too. I'm going to show a facial expression. And you're just going to say what it is. OK, what do you think? Friendly. Friendly. Satisfied. Satisfied. Pleasant. Pleasant. Mm, pleasant, but very <laughs> <laughs> There's an underlying anger. <laughs> what did you see? Anybody else see anything else? I see a little righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> Skeptical. Holding Satisfied. Back. Holding back. Silhouette. All right, let's try from closer without the light. Ready? I'll do another one now. Overconfident. Overconfident? What did you see? Huh? Smugness. Satisfied. Satisfied. Wait a minute. You think I'm smug, and you think I'm satisfied. Those are the same. <laughs> Condescending? <laughs> OK. All right, so let me just tell you. I was trying to do the same one for both. <laughs> and I was trying to be calm, just calm and content. <laughs> Which, to some people, is condescending. <laughs> and so what does this tell us about emotion perception? We're bad at it. You got to get, get out of the country. <laughs> the, um, it's in the eye of the beholder. But we've been taught through these television shows and these movies that it's like you, know, you just read people's facial expressions and you get it. But here I am. I've got condescending, smug, satisfied, content, happy, whatever. I, so many different responses to one facial expression. So now I'm working in your department. You're the dean, 600 faculty. You're in a, Dean Smith walks into a room and does this. <laughs> and some people are like, she's got a chip on her shoulder. <laughs> and then someone else says, oh, she's in a great mood today. <laughs> it's complicated which is why the only way to really know how someone is feeling is to ask them. You've got to build relationships, build connections. If you're not sure, like if I, you know, I only know Dean Smith through Zoom. It's our first time in person. You know, once we've hung out 150,000 times, I can be more accurate because I've got instances. I've got data. I see things happen in the world. I watch how she responds. Now I can be better at making predictions. But that takes a lot of time together to be accurate. So before that happens, you've got to ask a lot of questions and build relationships to know how they're feeling. You and Ruler, understanding of emotions. Why am I feeling this way? Where is this feeling coming from? <clears throat> so let me ask you this. What is the psychological difference between anger and disappointment? Who feels they're confident? I know I could define the psychological difference between anger and disappointment. The differences in the energy. So when you're disappointed, you're kind of low energy. And when you're angry, you're revved up. OK. Now, did you, let me repeat my question. What is the psychological difference? Sorry, I'm pushing you. The psychological difference. Oh, what do you think? No. There isn't. Anger is about an injustice. Anger is about injustice. You think there's been an injustice. Disappointment is an unmet expectation. You're a cheater. <laughs> <laughs> She's read my book 17 times. <laughs> but yes, that's exactly right. So anger is about a perceived injustice. Disappointment is about an unmet expectation. 
All right, jealousy and envy. Say more. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not one of those easy, I don't give easy A's. <laughs> so, right, jealousy, yeah. So jealousy is when you feel threatened that you're gonna lose someone important to you, right? You fear the loss of somebody that's important to you. It's a lot of times it's triangulation. You know, like in my office, if it's like I have two postdocs, one thinks, you know, I'm, I'm giving kind of more attention to the other, that's a jealousy situation. Mark likes that person better. Mark's gonna write them a better letter of recommendation. That's jealousy. Envy is wanting what someone else has. Yeah. So there are differences. We go on and on about this in terms of understanding, you know, why we have our feelings, the appraisal process, labeling emotions, right? Within the within one family, right? You can have lots of different feelings. You can be peeved, irritated, angry, enraged. Those are all part of the anger family. You can be many forms of anxiety too. You can be panicky. You can be overwhelmed. You could be stressed. You could be anxious. You could be fearful. You can just be kind of uneasy, all different emotions. And I, I shared this with one of the groups today in my research with my own students, talking about how IQ and emotional intelligence are not so correlated, is a lot of my students say the worthy is stress, anxious, stress, anxious, stress, anxious, stress, anxious. And I did follow-up research with my students, and I found that the number one emotion that they were really feeling wasn't anxiety or stress, it was envy. That there's a, the mindset of the student is this one's richer, this one's got more connections, this one studies less and gets better grades. That's not stress. That's actually envy. And so why that's important is that you got to label it to regulate it. Right? We, if we're just going to give people a breathing exercise to deal with their envy, like that's not going to work. Like you breathe in like, now I hate you even more for what you have. <laughs> I mean, think about it. <laughs> Expressing emotions. Knowing how and when to express emotion with different people across culture and context. So this is an important one because not everyone has equal permission to express their feelings. I give that example, I mean, I've lived it for many years in my family because um, I'm a white guy who is a doctor, and I, my husband is Latino, he's from Panama, and is dark skinned, and we go to places and we have, there are different rules for us. In my own apartment building, when we moved in there, people asked him whose dogs he was walking. <coughs> Nobody asked me, ever would ask me that question. Think about that. That creates emotional labor. You start becoming a little less comfortable being your true self when you're constantly bombarded with people perceiving you a certain way. I'm a white guy. I get angry. People are like, oh, like something's wrong. If I were a person of color and angry, I might get arrested. Same anger, same level of intensity. It's perceived one is a threat, one is danger, one is OK. And I share that with you, and I can go on with these examples. Same thing, by the way, going back to emotion perception. If I gave you facial expressions to decode, and I had a white person doing this, and a black person doing that, I will tell you right now, there will be more signal that the person of color's facial expression is displaying more anger than the same exact kind of, you can do it you know, through technology with morphing and make the exact same movements. But yet, there would be an over uh, attribution of negative emotion. And I, I share that for, uh, I think it's important for people to know, but more importantly, for me, what it makes me realize and understand better is that it's not the job of the individual to ask for the permission. Right? 
it's the job of society to ensure that everyone has the permission. I mean, families and schools and universities and communities. And what it also tells me is that emotional intelligence is not about the individual, right? As a kid, I'll just give you, like, coming from that, my abuse, I went for therapy. My parents were, they didn't know what to do. My father almost killed the man. It was a really bad week. Um, and they got me a therapist. They knew to do that. And I went to therapy for that one hour a week and played ping pong with my therapist. And then I went back to a family that was really not doing so well. And I went back to a school where I was being bullied every day. And it got worse because people found out about my abuse and that just didn't go well. And, and so I think about this all the time. Like we're trying to make change in the world. And we're trying to say like, you go for emotional intelligence training. Not really. It's we all got to go for emotional intelligence training. Because the more people who are surrounding us, who are playing by the same rules of emotional intelligence, right, the more developed we're going to become. The last skill is regulating emotions. So what do we do with all these feelings? And I know that I have to end in about five minutes. Is that about right? I don't know. You just tell me when I got to end. Because I'll go on and on. <laughs> If no one has to go anywhere, we're staying. It's right. Who wants to go on the rain anyway? So what, you know, what are the strategies that we use to regulate? I've been really curious about this. As a matter of fact, it's my next book. Because I've been, it was funny, the pandemic hit. All these people were, I got letters upon letters. Mark, thank you for giving me permission to feel. <laughs> but now what the hell do I do with all these feelings? <laughs> and so it's like, wow, I didn't realize how much how much deeper I needed to go with the regulation piece. And I started trying to figure out what are people doing, what does the research show, what are people asking for? And I've basically put it into these buckets, which is the first is all about permission to feel. Just like attitudinally, you just got to be like, you know what? I've got my feelings. And it's very liberating. You know, I've had anxiety for 54 years. And I've tried a lot of different things to get rid of my anxiety. And then as I was writing this book, I realized, Mark, like, there's nothing to get rid of. There's nothing to get rid of. It's like you just have been brought up in this world where you believe that your anxiety is bad. But look at you. You've done pretty well. So maybe it's not so bad after all. Maybe you're making it worse than it is. Maybe if you had more acceptance of who you are, it wouldn't be so burdensome. The second is that we, gotta, we do have to be aware. We have to get granular. We have to have the language. We need to be able to communicate. Because sometimes the anxiety gets really extreme, and I need social support, or I need to rethink it. At night, if I'm ruminating for an hour and a half before I go to bed about something I said in this talk, which I probably will do, um, I'm going to have to say to myself at some point, Mark, let it go. <laughs> you're, 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 you're left. It's like, fine, whatever, move on. Or say something kind to myself to put myself so I can sleep. So you do need strategies, no matter what. The third is you've got to know how to manage your body's budget. A lot of people say to me, I'm, I'm trying to be a better parent. I'm trying to be a better partner. But like, and I'm just so tired all the time. And so what that tells us right, is that sleep is a prevention factor for good regulation. It's hard to get up the resources to regulate. It takes energy. I mean, when you think about this, Emotion regulation is energy. You're pausing, you're trying to label your feeling, and you're trying to think creatively about how I can handle it in that moment. That's a lot of brain power. If you're doing that all day long, at home, at school, at work, you're going to be tired. You need to replenish. You need to get the fuel. And that's going to come from physical activity and getting good sleep and eating healthy foods. You got to know how to quiet the noise. I mean, when you think about it, teenagers are spending, on average, nine hours a day on their phones, on social media. Think about that, how much time they're spent distracted. And then we ask people to sit in a presentation for an hour. And it, it, it's like, I can't do that. My brain is not, I, I, gotta, you know, I don't like it, I'm going to swipe. <laughs> but it's true. How much energy do we put into being still? 
It's hard work to be still, to sit with, and not be trying to get the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. We do have to learn how to manage our thoughts, because we are our own worst self-saboteurs. Um, we have to learn how to ask for help. It's funny. Many of you may know the, the research on grit, G-R-I-T, the principle of grit. So um, I st I'm starting this new web series, which you should all join on YouTube. It's called Dealing with Feelings. And I'm interviewing the world's leading experts in emotion regulation and celebrities and Navy SEALs and really creative people about how they've dealt with emotions throughout their life and what strategies were the most helpful. And then I kind of link it to the research. And I interviewed Angela Duckworth, um, who is the writer and the author of Grit. And she looks at me, and I've known her for years. And I'm like, you know, tell me, I want to know about you. And the research, whatever. You know, I know that research. I want to know about how do you deal with your feelings? And she's like, Mark, I'm going to be honest with you. Last year was the worst year of my workplace life. I just, I hated my career. I was depressed. I was trying to write my book. I didn't get it done. I'm trying to, I felt like I had no confidence. Nobody, you know, I just had nothing to offer. I was thinking about changing my career. And I said, well, what was your strategy? And she said, I would call my mother. <laughs> I'm like, but you're grit. I thought it's just grit. You know, he's like, push through it. She's like, well, our grit's important. It's not everything. You know, and she said, then my number one strategy for dealing with my stuff is perspective taking. And she goes, and sometimes I journal to get perspective, but a lot of times I reach out to my advisory board of the key people in my life who I know I can talk to about difficult things and just have them kind of do a little coaching with me to help me see it from a different perspective. So I think that's so important for us to know that you don't have to do this alone. I think we're brought up in a society that tells people you gotta figure it out. And here we have like a MacArthur Genius Award winner, best-selling author of a book about grit, and her number one strategy is calling her mother. <laughs> or you know, someone else. So I don't think we should underestimate the social piece of regulation. And the last piece is just learning really how to spend your time wisely. <clears throat> you know, are you doing those things that bring you joy? You know, for me, it is yoga. I love going to yoga. And so if I put it on my schedule, it's great. If I don't put it on my schedule, I don't do it. Um, I live in the country now. You know, I oftentimes forget that I can go outside and just stare at a tree or a pond. And then when I do it, I always feel better. All right, let's take a deep breath. Why not? I'm going to ask you to think about which one of these strategies you might bring into your life. Which area of regulation do you think you might benefit from putting a little more time into? Is it just giving yourself the permission to feel? Is it, I want to be more granular and specific and I want to label my feelings better? Is it your budget? Is it quiet in the noise? Is it the thinking? Is it the social piece? Is it doing things that you enjoy? I think it's important to notice also that you can set goals about things, but there are going to be barriers to those goals. Things are going to get in the way of you applying this strategy. And so sometimes we need strategies to deal with the barriers for the strategies that we want to use. Does that make sense? Like I'm going to, Mark, you're going to the gym. You're going to work out. But then I don't put it on my calendar, or I make excuses for myself every time I'm about to go work out. So the goal, or the, the strategy that I want to use more actually doesn't even get implemented. So then I have to work on like my self-talk. I had this whole thing. I started working out a lot. And every time I'd work out, I'm like, Mark, you're 54. Like, huh, huh. You know, like, like, what are you doing with your life? This is ridiculous. And I would say, Mark, like, why are you being a self-saboteur right now? And I came up with a phrase for every time I was about to give up on my workout. And it was, who are you fooling? And so whenever I was about to be like, I don't need to do that extra set. Like, you've done enough. And I would just stop and say, Mark, who are you fooling? OK. <gasps> you know? But it works. Like, you got you know, you to like, use it. You got to try the strategies out. 
So let me wrap up by saying a few last things. One is, in my work in the, in the real world, in terms of like leaders and companies, this is a study of 14,000 people across the workforce. And we looked at supervisors who were low in emotional intelligence versus supervisors who are high in emotional intelligence. And we just want to know, did the teams, did they function any differently? Here's what we found. People said they were more likely to have opportunities to learn new skills when they worked for a supervisor who was higher in emotional intelligence. Significantly less likely to want to leave their jobs. Significantly higher job satisfaction, job satisfaction. Lower burnout, higher engagement. They were less afraid of speaking up when there was a problem. And we found that there was, they were more ethical. Like they actually, we were in this one company, which I can't mention the name of because it's confidential, but um, the employees, when they were working for supervisors who were lower in emotional intelligence, it was a company that um, rates products. They were just like, oh, who cares? They just didn't, they, they just felt like their, their bosses, they didn't really care about them, and they're like, you know, I'm just gonna pass this product. So think about your electrical products, think about the food you're eating. <laughs> You're going to wish for those emotionally intelligent leaders. <laughs> this is um, another study that we did during, the, during COVID. And I think what's interesting here is that we looked at personal well-being. And we found that people, the, the same findings we had with occupational stuff. Um, but what we found was that the employees who worked on teams with leaders <clears throat> who were higher in emotional intelligence had more positive emotions on a daily basis, fewer negative emotions, fewer mental health problems, and they actually slept better. Think about that. Okay, so just a few last things and then we'll take some questions and then we'll go. Um, I wanna make sure you have resources. So I'm delighted and honored that you got some books to give away. Um, you can certainly read that. There's that webcast that I mentioned to you called Dealing With Feelings. So just you go onto YouTube and subscribe to the channel and those will be released in two weeks. Um, really excited about kind of giving away for free resources to people to learn how to regulate. You'll see some really interesting, uh, the Navy SEAL one is really interesting. Um, just talking about like it's tough Navy SEAL. He's like, you know, Mark, I shouldn't really talk about my feelings. But <laughs> um, and then if you're interested in the app, that's another access um, to this. Okay, here we go. Raise your hand if you believe that emotions matter. Cool. How many of you are gonna give yourself permission to feel? Well, the hands were a little lower there. <laughs> you know, how many of you are gonna give other people permission to feel? All right, good. I always say just be an Uncle Marvin. That's my new hashtag, be an Uncle Marvin. Um, related to that, I got an, uh, maybe a year ago, I got an, an email from a 97-year-old man, and he had read my book, and he wrote me this email saying how grateful he was to read something like this in his 90s, and how he had, was reflecting on how different his life might have been, and his relationships might have been with his family and his wife, um, and I was just so moved by it. And I said, just like, I had to I communicate with him, and I just wrote him back, and I said, like, you just made my day. You know, thank you so much, you know, um, for sharing that. And the guy wrote back to me, and he goes, no, Mark, thank you for being my Uncle Marvin. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh. You know, that's what makes you feel good, right? You know, it can take, you know, finding people, you know, and helping people, it really does. It's amazing. You know, it's almost like a twofer. And I say it a twofer because when you are the Uncle Marvin, you notice how people's affect shifts. Right? They feel different. They feel heard. They feel seen. And what happens for us is that when we see that in other people, it reciprocates on us. I'm going to ask you all to strive to be the emotion scientist, not the emotion judge. You know, of course, it's better to start early. You know, my work starts in preschool and goes all the way up to companies and C-suites and universities. But the good news is that the areas of your brain that are responsible for developing the skills of emotional intelligence do not atrophy. 
you learned something today, I hope, that you can take with you. You can always build your language. You can learn a new feeling word. You can always try a new strategy out. They're there for you to try. You have to know that. Um, but it is life's work. It is life's work. And so my last words to all of you are, um, oftentimes people, you know, they want that quick fix. Oftentimes, you know, and I even have people come up to me, I've sometimes, you know, given what I do, and they say things like, you know, but Mark, like, look at you, you made it. You know, with all of your trauma and everything that happened, look at you, you're so successful. And I always say, you know, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I feel blessed to be where I am in life. But you got to know, it was a journey. And I'm still on the journey. And God bless Uncle Marvin. God bless that person who came into my life who gave me permission to feel. I also got involved in the martial arts and became a martial arts teacher. I also got a PhD in psychology. I also have written you know, 200 scholarly articles and 15,000 curriculum and talked about this stuff ad nauseum. Like I'm, a, I'm working on this stuff. I put a lot of effort into my emotional development. And so I want to just ask you to take a moment and think about your own emotional development. Right? How much effort do you want to put into it? Is it worth it? Think about the people in your dorms. Think about the 600 people that you supervise or support. How many of them have gotten the emotion education they need so they achieve their dreams? So they make the best decisions, build and maintain the best relationships, have good mental health achieve their goals. And so I'll end by saying, you know, by no means, you know, is this um, a magic pill, but maybe it's a good place to start. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and by the way, I recognize people have to leave. It's late. Yes? I guess my question was, how do you navigate conflicts with people who don't like talking about their emotions and expressing it in a yeah. place, in a classroom setting, et cetera? So how do you navigate conflict you know, in terms of using these skills? You know, I, that's a, it's a big question. And I think that part of it is recognizing that people's comfort or discomfort with conflict is mostly around their comfort, discomfort with being dysregulated. Meaning they, they, if you can't deal with the feelings that you're gonna have when you're going back and forth about something that you don't agree on, you get activated and then you either wanna, or run away. And so my goal is to help people learn the skills. One of the things that you're bringing up though also, it's really important, is that these are real world skills. So they're a little bit different than doing your math homework or your science homework. Because like, you know, when I'm on vacation, I'm sitting on the beach, which sounds great right now, actually. Um, like, I'm not thinking like about my emotional intelligence, honestly. I'm thinking about like, life is good. I'm blessed that I have this. But when someone kicks the sand in your face, oof, that's when you gotta use your emotional intelligence, right? Because the, the system has been activated. And that's what's hard. It's hard to use it in, the, in real time. It's easy to use it in your brain. Like you can say, oh, like if this happens, I will say that. And then all of a sudden you're in the situation and you can't do it because you never practiced it. And so my, my work is really about helping people not only learn it, but practice it a lot. Because you need to practice it and role playing it because it's hard. Yeah. This was a wonderful talk. Thank you. The story that uh, you felt able to give, I think, and the transformation that uh, your emotional intelligence enabled you to make in your own life.
life is, is quite wonderful, and there's a great feeling in this room. I'm wondering, however, um, whether the relation, about the relationship between learning those skills yep. as an individual and undergoing what could be called self-regulation, mm -hmm. and um, the society uh, that profits from self-regulation. Or from dysregulation. Uh, no, from self-regulation. Say uh, more. Because that's where you're dealing uh, with um, a social order uh, that needs transformation. And if everyone is self-regulating, uh, that is, has a scientist approach, yeah. without transforming what's learned, what you've learned, about the ways in which a self cannot own, you, you haven't been regulated, you've been transformed. Mm -hmm. How then do you translate that yeah, into the transformation of an order that makes you feel, you yourself feel every night as if you have to self-regulate and cope? Yeah. If the order itself is like that uh, character put his, uh, his, his elbows out mm -hmm. and gave you a sense of what's happened to you, if that's, if that's the face of the social order, how does self-regulating transform that? Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think it's definitional. So notice that my definition of, of self, at first I didn't even use the term self-regulation, right? We use the term emotion regulation. It's you in, use the term ruler in your yeah. acronym. Yeah. And you talk about in your last, how do you regulate yourself? This works well for a corporation. So we have a lot of people no, I hear you. deal with their emotions by self-regulating. Then the corporation doesn't have to be transformed. That's yeah, I would just I agree I agree with you. I agree with you, a hundred percent. And the definition of emotion regulation. Let me just show you because I, I skipped that slide. Is this slide still up? Yeah. To give you more precision, is the thoughts and actions that we use to prevent, reduce, initiate, initiate emotions. Not just we're not. So emotion regulation from the perspective of emotional intelligence is not about controlling them, ever. It's about learning how to use your emotions wisely to achieve an outcome. So if I'm going to be at a protest to fight against an injustice, my regulation strategy isn't like, Mark, don't say it. It's going to be, Mark, figure out a way to communicate this in a way that's going to get everybody on your bus. That also is regulation. Um, I'll give you an example of that just to give you kind of how this works. So I worked on this project with Lady Gaga, the singer, not the researcher. And, um, <laughs> um, and the, uh, it was really fun, because we, we had a, a whole uh, symposium at Yale. We did a study together. We, we, we surveyed 45,000 people. And the, the, but the project was about, it was called the Emotion Revolution. And you know, I was coming in as the scientist. She was coming in as the communicator. Anyhow, long story short, we had to figure out, like, what are we going to do? Like, what are we going to do? How is a pop star going to work with people, someone like me? That was yellow, brainstorming. We're like, we're going to do this. We're going to try this. We're going to try this. Let's do this. Let's do that. You know, there was a million ideas, because that's what the yellow quadrant does. It helps, be, it helps you be generative. So I put all these ideas out there. I'm like, but like, we can't. Like, well, who's going to do all these things? Like, it's not realistic. So he said, oh, let's get in the green. Let's be. Let's get like let's put some classical music on. <laughs> Not like I'm on the edge of glory, but like let's be calm and let's all walk around and look at look at the post-its and ask ourselves like which one of these is like meaningful, which one's gonna have the biggest benefit. So with my little persuasion, we decided to do a research study. <laughs> and it was to survey high school students across America. So we agreed on that. Then we had to realize, we had to think about the study. Like, so who's going to, how are we going to get the data collected? And then we had this like, problem because Lady Gaga's little monsters, right? that's going to be a biased sample. It's a terrible study. So we had to figure out all these different ways of like, getting better data so it wasn't just a study of little monsters. We got the data. Big study. We analyzed the data. Didn't matter if you were a little monster or, or whatever. We found that 75% of the feelings that high school students experience each day are negative. They're tired, they're bored, they're stressed, plus other things. And there was, we, we went through a lot of detail of this. Anyhow, we analyzed the data. It was a big study, national study. And then I got invited to the White House. This is two administrations ago to do a, a presentation. 
and the, and the Secretary of Education was going to be there, and a lot of big players were going to be there. And so I had to think to myself, Mark, what's the goal? Like, what is your goal of presenting these data? Is your goal to like, for everybody like, that was a great presentation. Not really, that's not going to have any impact. I could have done that. I could have been like, everybody, I'm so excited to be here. Have I got to study for you? <laughs> or I could have gone in and decided to regulate myself in a way that's like, you know what? Let's all take a deep breath. Let's be calm. I don't want people to be calm. 75% of high school students are tired, bored, and stressed. That's not good. I could have been in the blue and said, you know, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm going to present a study to you about the emotional lives of high schoolers. You know, my hunch is that will have no impact. Because like, <laughs> let's think about education reform in our society. Doesn't really go anywhere. I was like, that's not a goal. And then I realized that my goal actually was to get people to be angry. I wanted them to leave angry. Angry at the education system that is not preparing our kids. How many kids who are tired, born and stressed are going to be the kids, the students are innovators. And they're just, they're, they are just don't want to be there. So I had to figure out a way to put, and I'm not like good at that, actually. But I was like, Mark, you're going to present this in a way that is going to get them fired up, that are going to be, we got to do something about it. We got to do something about this. And so my point of telling you that little story is that that was emotion regulation. That was creating an emotion that I felt was going to be the most necessary to have an outcome happen. Sometimes it's marked, don't say it, because you're going to get yourself in trouble. That's a different form of regulation. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I saw your hand up. Uh, the woman, the, and, and then you. And then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Please, yes, yes, you. <laughs> Okay. So cool. I all throughout elementary school, we Great. went to the second step. Was it and, you did second step? Yeah. Um, I was at a private school. And then I was also at a private school for middle high and like the closest teacher I had was our social emotional learning coordinator. Awesome. So I was very close to that and I still feel like I could not handle myself sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So it makes me kind of feel sad sometimes that like somebody has invested a lot of money into me being an emotionally regulated person and I'm not. <laughs> yeah, well, it's life's work, so number one. I'm 54, and I'm still like, you know, the pandemic hit, and I'm like, I'm a mess. So you're not going to, it's a, you know, I will also say, and I'm not going to say what I'm going to say. There are multiple models of teaching these things, and some of them are kind of like programmatic lessons, and some of them are more about infusing principles and skills into the entire immune system of a setting. Most models are more of the lesson plan thing as opposed to really embedding the core principles into the way the adults interact with children, you know, and the parents interact and learn skills. So I think it's, and it's, you just have to recognize that this is, your life space now is very different than when you were in high school and the, thing, the opportunities for you to regulate or learn about emotions are different with your roommates, with sports, with classrooms. Yeah. Sure. Um, in elementary school specifically, when um, educators are talking to students about your ruler model, yeah. um, who are the educators? Are they, are they guidance counselors? Are they um, yeah. uh, physical education teachers? Um, so that's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, what is do you have data on when are young kids or young students most open to this kind of sure. conversation and information? Great questions. Um, so the first is I learned, and, and I, this wasn't a presentation about the ruler program. That's a whole other presentation in terms of like our curriculum and training and support systems for schools. That wasn't you know, relevant for this group. But to just give you the down, the quick, the quick kind of answer to that is I started my career with my uncle, and we wrote a curriculum for kids. Our teachers would deliver these lessons on feelings, and we failed, horrifically failed, because the educators were not ready to do it. They didn't have the emotion education to do it well. And so they'd say things like, you know, you're in the red today? Well, what's new? I'm like, <laughs> like, 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 
what, what is happening? I remember I was videotaping this one, my favorite, I was videotaping this one, you gotta videotape Mrs. Johnson teaching the lesson. I go into the school, I'm sitting in the back of the classroom, and we're filming this teacher, and she's talking about her mood. And she's like, you know, everyone, you know, Mrs. Johnson's in the blue today. And I'm like, oh wow, she's being authentic, that's cool. And so then she goes, and my strategy is that I realized today that we don't have school next week. And so I'm going to be thinking about that all day. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't really, like, I am going to have a nervous breakdown in this class. And so, like, I learned very quickly in my career that it, the kids were going to be OK uh, if the adults were educated. And so our model has turned into one that's a lot about adult education. And then we realize that if leaders don't support the educators, nothing happens. They don't give them the time to do it. They don't have accountability metrics. And then we found if the school board doesn't get involved, then the superintendent's going to get involved. So it became a systemic model. So that's, it's taken me 15, 20 years to figure that out. And we're still, it's still, program, you know, with 50% of, of teachers leaving the profession in four years, like, how do you keep the system going? And then your second question that I just want to. Is there, is there data about the age? Yeah, yeah. What I'll tell you is that it's not about the student's openness. It's about the way it's delivered to students that create the openness or not. So if you know how to present, data, present these concepts in a way that are developmentally appropriate, it works at every grade level. It is harder to do at high school than it is in It's always harder in high school than it is in middle than it is in elementary. But I've seen we have 5,000 schools doing this. And I've seen high schools that you just can't believe what's happening. I'll end with a just, I have to end with one little cute little anecdote. I think I shared it in one of the meetings today. But I was visiting a fifth grade classroom last week because I was doing some research with them. And we were, I was teaching them about creativity. Um, what, is, what is creativity? And how do, you, how do you think creatively about dealing with emotional problems, like solving difficult, like the complex stuff? And so the ending was, I asked kids, you know, what did you think about today's lesson? What's your take home message? And this little boy raises and he goes, sir, today I learned the role of divergent thinking in solving emotion problems. <laughs> and I'm thinking, like, that is freaking cool. <laughs> like, I didn't, first I didn't know what these concepts were as a kid. But that he had, had processed this class, this lesson, on that intersection, it was pretty remarkable to me. I'm going to tell you that it is unbelievably possible to teach these skills at any age that we underestimate how much or how creative people can be when they're given the opportunities. And I know we got to go. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.